Computer processors are fascinating pieces of engineering. If you consider all of their moving parts, they are some of the most complex machines humanity has ever produced. Nowadays, processors are absolutely ubiquitous, inhabiting your laptop and desktop computers, your phone, TV, car, the heating system in your home, your fridge, oven, hot plate, even your doorbell. Processors and CPUs, as they are common today, have been around for 50 years and have come a long way since their inception. Early processors were absolutely tiny and ran at a snail's pace. The 6502, for example, was built from only 4,500 transistors and ran at a whopping 3 MHz. Then, as computers started to make their way into our homes, CPUs became ever more popular and demand and performance has been increasing since. The relatively simple designs of the 70s with few transistors have gradually grown into multi-billion transistor monsters of incredible complexity. In this video series, I would like to explore the concepts that make modern processors so incredible by building my own 8-bit superscalar out-of-order processor from discrete logic chips. Doing this in 8 bits is great because it keeps the boring parts small, like the arithmetic unit, the data paths, the registers, all of which scale with the bit width. That allows me to focus on the juicy bits of the hardware, like instruction fetch, scheduling, reordering, or speculation, which is where all the magic happens. The size of these is more dependent on how fancy and sophisticated the processor is, and not so much on its bit width. Here's how we're going to achieve this. I'm going to build up the hardware in two stages. First, we'll prototype new circuits on breadboards. These breadboards are extremely useful, because you can arrange and rearrange chips as you like, you can wire them up, see if they work, solve problems you come across, until everything works. In terms of actual chips, I'm mainly going to stick to the 74HC series, which contains all sorts of useful discrete logic, like AND gates, multiplexers, inverters, buffers, registers, and a lot more. But they're also pretty simple and straightforward, and modern processors are built pretty much from the same components, just that they're not separate chips, but integrated into a single big one. I expect us to end up with a handful of breadboards that look something like this. Some chips, some switches, some LEDs to show what's going on, and lots of wires all over the place. The big downside of breadboards is that they use a lot of space, and the wiring is pretty flimsy and unreliable. So once I'm happy with how a circuit works on the breadboard, I would like to move it over to a dedicated PCB. There are quite a few manufacturers that can produce these pretty cheaply in low quantities, and they look much nicer and cleaner than the breadboards. Also, since it's a proper PCB, we can miniaturize things and use the much smaller surface mount variants of our chips and LEDs. We're likely to need multiple redesigns of most PCBs, mainly because I want to slowly increase the level of complexity of the CPU over time, which is bound to require changes to the existing circuitry. So, how do we slowly escalate the complexity of the processor as we keep designing it? The simplest approach to building a CPU is to allow an instruction to take multiple clock cycles, which you could call subscalar execution. When the processor encounters an instruction, it works through a list of steps required to execute that instruction. For example, an add instruction might load the left-hand side in the first cycle, the right-hand side in the second cycle, perform the addition in the third cycle, and store the result in the fourth cycle. More complex instructions just require more cycles to execute, but you can get away with pretty minimal hardware. A slightly tougher approach is to try and execute instructions in a single cycle, which is generally called scalar execution. The CPU no longer has the option to split instructions into steps and spread them out over time. Instead, it must have enough hardware to perform all steps in parallel. This also means that our most complex instruction dictates how much hardware we actually need. An even trickier approach is to execute multiple instructions per cycle, which is generally called superscalar execution. Since instructions already take on the order of a single cycle to execute, the only chance we have to increase throughput is to start executing multiple instructions in parallel. Here the complexity of the CPU shifts towards resolving dependencies among instructions and detecting hazards, and also how to even fetch and decode multiple instructions at once. This translates to a disproportionate increase in hardware complexity, because we multiply the instruction execution hardware, but also we have to add some bookkeeping hardware on top of that. 
An even harder approach is to allow for the instructions in a program to execute out of order, which is usually combined with superscalar execution. Instead of making an instruction wait for all its operands, the CPU can look ahead in the program to see if any of the following instructions might already be able to execute, and run them first. In such a processor, the complexity shifts entirely towards organizing the instructions in a data structure that allows for them to be fired off when all their input data is ready, and for them to finish in any order they'd like. This breaks the CPU pipeline wide open and requires an entirely different machine architecture to execute. This series will be all about exploring the concepts and trade-offs that are needed to push a CPU from taking many cycles per instruction towards being able to execute multiple instructions every single cycle, in an order independent from the original program. As a rough plan of action, and maybe also a sort of outlook on the series, I would like to do the following. First, I'd like to build a basic 8-bit CPU with 16-bit addressing. This requires establishing the basic control flow logic, such as the program counter, instruction fetching, and implementing jumps and branches. Then we'll need some general purpose registers, an ALU to perform some computation on those registers, and generally a mechanism to move data in and out of the register file. Finally, the CPU also needs access to some form of memory, and a few special 16-bit addresses, such that we can access more than just 256 bytes. We'll also have to come up with an instruction encoding, and I already have a few ideas in mind about that. With this baseline processor in place, I would like to look into taking the overall pipeline architecture to the next level. This will include reorganizing the CPU into functional units, adding interfaces to dispatch operations to those units, and letting them write back their results. Since this allows for instructions to run in parallel and take multiple cycles to complete, we will also need a form of hazard detection to make sure instructions don't start until all their inputs are available. With this more modular CPU, we can start to look into fancier concepts, such as register renaming, superscalar execution for some of the blocks, and reservation stations to enable out-of-order execution. Beyond that, there are more advanced and more modern techniques that I would love to look into, like multiple issue, which will enable sustained superscalar execution, speculation and branch prediction, instruction compression, exceptions and interrupts, caching, virtual memory, various operating system concerns, and much more. I would also like to add quite a bit of software work alongside the main CPU build, since we'll want to run some programs on it as well. My hope is that with this build we can, in a sense, rediscover some of the techniques that make up modern computing, and experiment with them in a simple but hands-on kind of setting. In the first few episodes of the series, I would like to look at how we can generate different clock signals for the CPU, so we have an easier time debugging the hardware as we build it. Also, it's important that we have a clean way of resetting the CPU, so it always starts up in the same state and box can be reproduced. After that, we'll be off to the races and start designing and building the actual CPU. Thanks a lot for watching. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more of this, and see you for the first build episode next time.